It's being conscious of these expectations, working at bypassing them that allows us to visually engage in our creativity, either realistically or fantastically, or maybe even something in between. Hello, all my wonderful creative friends. Thank you for joining me for the Sage Arts Podcast. I'm Sage, your host. I'm rather on my own today. Well, except I have you, right? So I want to invite you in, come have a seat. We've got lots of juicy stuff to talk about today. If you're at all a note taker, do grab yourself a pen and paper. If your hands and eyes are otherwise occupied, save the note taking for later. And as a matter of fact, I'll tell you how to get a transcription of the episodes towards the end if you want some typed up content. Or you can sign up for my weekly newsletter. It gives you show release reminders and bonus material when those are available. They also have direct links to a page with the transcriptions each week, and it can be flagged for a reminder to an episode that you want to return to. Sign up for that using the link in the show notes or at thesagearts.com under the notices item at the top or look for a news and notices button on the home page. All right. The subject we are going to talk about today is the art of sight. In other words, the difference between our everyday seeing abilities and what we do artistically. So come in, have a seat. There's a comfy couch corner, just a corner of a couch (laughs) here. The dogs have not taken it over yet. So it's yours for the taking. Jump on in. If you're in the studio listening to this, congrats on getting down to work on stuff. I love the idea that people are out there listening and allowing me to be a part of your creative day. Before we get into the subject matter, let me do a shout out, a very special one this episode, because I was on the other side of the mic, so to speak. I was interviewed on the Handmade Mentor podcast hosted by Vanessa S. Ph.D. I think her last name is actually O'Neill, but she goes by that short moniker. I love the Ph.D. on the end. It makes her sound kind of unassuming and accomplished all at the same time. Pretty awesome. But yeah, Vanessa interviews all types of creatives, a lot of multi-crafters like myself, and she just kind of digs into what we do and what makes us tick. So if you want to hear what I sound like when I have no notes in front of me, listen to Vanessa's latest episode of The Handmade Mentor. It's a little different. There's lots of ums and long pauses, but it's real, you know. So you can find The Handmade Mentor by doing a search on any podcast player or go to her website at thehandmadementor.com. I just want to thank Vanessa for the opportunity and for having such a fun discussion and for asking me some really hard questions that really made me think. And if you find what I share or she shares or anyone who shares with a labor of love project like these, do give back when you can. If what I do helps you, giving back can be done in the show notes. There's links there or on the homepage of thestagearts.com where a little scroll down that homepage, you'll find buy me a coffee and PayPal donation buttons. You can also grab yourself stickers or a book at 10thmusearts.com. That's 10th spelled out, T-E-N-T-H, musearts.com. Your support and your notes and all the things that you do to let me know that what I'm doing is hitting the right buttons for you. This helps keeps us crazy people going. Now on to you and your eyeballs, (laughs) sort of. Eyeballs are the least of the aspect of sight that we need to be concerned with, although having them operating correctly is usually a good thing. But strangely enough, you do not need to have good eyesight to have artistic sight. Here's a bit of related trivia. Edgar Degas painted some of his most influential and best known works of art while nearly blind from macular degeneration. Yeah, being an artist doesn't mean you have to see well. You just have to have the passion and willingness to seek out your vision so you can share it with other people. And that's kind of the core of what we're going to talk about today. The question you might want to keep in mind as you listen is, do you consciously look at the world through your lens as an artist? In other words, do you stop to consider how you are seeing things and make a conscious effort to look with intention? Let's start by defining what it means to see. And of course, we can start with the physical interaction of the eye with light. Light is what brings the information about the visual world around us to us. It bounces off of surfaces, comes in through the pupils, hits those cones and rods on the backside of the eyeball, triggering nerves to send this initial raw information to the brain. Now, that's pretty straightforward, but that's like the last straightforward thing we're going to be discussing today. And this is because the way the brain uses that information is very complex. And I don't mean the physiology of how the brain has to operate in order to take it in and feed it to our consciousness. I'm talking about what the brain actually does with the information. 
You see, the brain is not an unbiased receiver of information. It's not a computer that just puts it into a document or files it as is. It literally can't take that info and give it to you unretouched. It would be like reading the ones and zeros that the computer uses in order to collect and organize information. It would make no sense to you. So there's tons of retouching, refocusing, cropping, recoloring, literally and metaphorically by the brain because the brain is an interpreter. And that's not a straightforward thing. You may have noticed that every time you see a book that's been translated, there is a byline for the translator because one translator isn't going to come up with the same thing another translator will. So it's almost like the work has been redone by the translator. And that's because there isn't an unwavering word for word equivalent between any two languages. So the translator has to make choices about how to best represent each thought in that book in this new language with what the language has available. And sometimes there's just simply not a real equivalence or the translated into language doesn't have the same vocabulary for certain subjects. And the brain does the same thing. There aren't one for one equivalences between what we see and the language our brains use to understand it. I'm sure you've been at some point or another stumped for the words to describe something that you're seeing. The language or languages available to us are the primary resource for interpretation for our brains. So the limitations that our languages have also are limitations for our brains. In other words, our brains often take what we see and translate it into words in our minds in an effort to help our consciousness to understand what we're seeing. It's why you need to be careful with the words you use, particularly your inner language to yourself, because the language you use sets the brain up for the way it interprets our world. So for instance, if you talk negatively about something, your brain will interpret it visually as negative as well, even when things would appear positive if you had not known this thing before. That's kind of another subject, but here's a big hint. Talk positively to yourself about the work that you're doing, and you'll more likely see the success in it before the disappointments. It's just a good way to stay positive about your work and keep yourself motivated. Okay, back to the brain. The brain, it has limitations because of language, because language inherently has limitations. It's also limited by our understanding of various concepts, our personal knowledge base, our emotions, our social and cultural biases, and most importantly to artists, our expectations, which are gained through our experiences, as well as the other things just mentioned. So remember the idea of expectations as a limiting factor because it's going to keep coming up in this conversation. As you can imagine, these considerations and limitations are a lot for the brain to juggle and work through and use when interpreting what the eyeballs bring to the brain. So the brain sends the information to your consciousness in a kind of shorthand. You know when you're looking at a crowd of people and someone you know really well can be standing right there in front of you and you don't see them until they kind of wave at you. That's because our brains don't send everything we see to our consciousness. It can't. It's just too much information. But that means that we are missing things all the time. And not only that, what information it does send to you is often simplified or an abbreviation of that thing it's looking at. This is a big part of the reason why eyewitnesses have a hard time identifying something that they clearly saw because the brain didn't send them every detail. Now, it could be there kind of deeper in the unconsciousness and it could come out later. But your consciousness and memory that is stored from that consciousness is going to lack a lot of information. Now, this can be a problem for artists at times, although it can have some advantages maybe as well. We'll go into that a little bit later in this conversation. Another thing that limits what we see and the way we interpret what is visually before us is a hierarchy of importance. We don't always notice the details because our minds may want to, for various reasons, just focus on the whole scene. Or we don't see the big picture because we're distracted by a singular thing within the scene. So when you're at, say, an art fair, for instance, you may arrive and look at the whole scene. Streets are lined with tents. The avenues are filled with meandering groups of people, lots of color, just a busy, bustling scene before you. That tells you that the fair is probably a good one and there's probably lots to see and do and you can get excited about diving in. Now, from your view, there wasn't any one thing that was important at that moment, but rather the overall feel of the scene before you because you want to know whether you're likely to enjoy it and how much time you might want to spend there. 
Or conversely, you go into one of the booths at this fair and you see, say, a sculpture that really speaks to you. So you step closer and you examine it. And now you're not seeing the other people in the booth, certainly not outside the booth, not even maybe the rest of the artwork. Our focus becomes narrow because the thing of most importance is a singular item and the brain starts ignoring all the other things around it. There is a hierarchy of importance in most everything we see. The least important is so ignored, we may never remember it was there at all. And very small but important details can stick with us for the rest of our lives because we give it so much importance or because it was so new and interesting. Our brain does this evaluation constantly and mostly unconsciously. We evolved to forever be looking for danger, which is partly why we see the bad before the good stuff, right? As an artist, you hope to be able to do this intentionally, consciously. But we don't always recognize what is truly important for us, for our type of intention for our art, because we aren't being artistically mindful or we are distracted. And there's just so many things that we can be distracted by. One of the biggest things we are distracted by is something that doesn't meet our expectations or is new to us. This harkens back to the awareness of potential danger. We need to assess something new or unexpected as to what it means for our safety, our security, our well-being. But that means that the things which seem to fulfill our expectations are often ignored. And this is the area that begins to be problematic for artists. It's being conscious of these expectations, working at bypassing them, giving the familiar the same consideration as new or unexpected things that allows us to visually engage in our creativity, either realistically or fantastically, or maybe even something in between. I'll explain about that in a little bit. Now, this is not to say that new things won't get our muse all excited. They absolutely do and should. What I refer to is finding things new in things that are familiar because It's a rare thing that anything you run into is 100% new to us, and we really can gain a lot from seeing everything clearly and with new vision. First, let's talk about seeing realistically. I've taught my share of people how to draw, and it's usually been because someone has told me they can't draw, which I find to be pretty untrue for pretty much everyone. Every person in this world that can hold a pencil with any level of control can draw and realistically. It's not a talent of the hand. It's not some special gift of creativity. It's literally in how you see things. And if you get past your expectations, you can draw what's in front of you in a realistic fashion. So when you ask someone to say, draw a human head, they're probably immediately going to start thinking of something round, right? And if you have spent any time drawing or sculpting or whatnot, a human head, you know, it's pretty much anything but round. It's got lines and angles. There are some curves in it. There is a round cap to it, but it's got all kinds of different shapes in it. That said, don't you find it interesting that a circle with two dots in the top half and a curve in the bottom half can be seen as a face, as a smiley face, right? This is kind of an extreme shortcut of our understanding of what a face can look like. And it's pretty much what a brain does. It's just one example of how our brains will interpret information in a very simple way as a kind of shorthand for conveying the visuals around us. Now, if you've taken drawing or painting or any other classes where you are trying to replicate something out of the real world, you've probably run into some of this already. But seeing things as they are and interpreting things in all the various aspects they have to offer goes far beyond being able to see that a head is not round. For one, there is the influence of our experiences and knowledge. For instance, we've all interacted with a bowl. Bowls are round, they're hollow on the inside, and usually sit with that opening facing up. That's what we know of a bowl. So if you're asked to draw a bowl on a table that's sitting, say, just below eye level, what you already know of bowls is going to be a large part of the interpretation of what you're seeing. But that means that when you go to try to draw, say, the rim of the bowl, you're going to want to make it a circle because that's what you know about bowl rims. They're basically circles, right? But the view of that bowl rim sitting just below eye level in a two-dimensional space is not a continuous circle. It's not even an oval. It's not even continuous. It's actually two separate curved lines, one that curves up and over, one that curves down and over. They both have the same beginning and end points, but where they meet is basically an angled corner. 
But because what you know of bowls has nothing to do with angles, it's hard to see that unless you ask yourself and basically circumvent your brain's shorthand what the shapes of those lines actually are creating, what is actually seen from your viewpoint. This circumvention is really key to seeing artistically. Now, it doesn't always mean that you see things how they actually are. Like I said, this bit of conversation is about seeing realistically, but there's another way of seeing, right? You absolutely need to circumvent your brain's shorthand approach to information to see realistically so you can tell your hand what it needs to do to properly represent what is actually before you. And yes, this can be rather hard, but it's also very exciting to get yourself past those expectations and see things as if they are brand new to you. This brings us to the concept that what we see, for the most part, is actually incomplete, incorrect, or sometimes a straight-out lie. Because our brains interpret through what we know and have experience with, two people can see the same thing and describe it completely differently because they have different knowledge and they have different experiences. It's all about that interpretation thing that your brain is doing. A big part of it is that the brain is making choices about what is most important to you. Also, it's choosing what should be remembered, which isn't always about importance, but more commonly about the unexpected and the new. This is often wrapped up in our emotions and our state of mind at the time. So artistically, you need, in many instances, an awareness of your emotions and your mindset in order to really see what's going on in front of you and to draw the inspiration that you need for your artwork from what you're seeing The idea is that if you understand your emotions and your mindset, you can start to see what the important things really are in the scene. In addition to all that, we would also benefit from being conscious about whether we are scanning what's in front of us or if we're being mindful, being present, being in touch with all of the things that I'm talking about, being attentive and discerning of the scenes and the objects that are before us. In everyday types of sight of seeing, we generally take shallow glances with a cursory eye, usually because our surroundings are super familiar to us or we're tired or bored or deep in thought, right? But if you're trying to look artistically, you really don't want to be cursory. You want to spend some time with what you're looking at. Look deep and take in as much detail as you can. This can happen automatically when our curiosity is awakened or we are in a flow state. I mean, maybe you've noticed sometimes when you're working on your art, if you get really into it, you start seeing every little detail in those flow moments because hyper awareness of those small things, even the most minimal texture, the edges, the movements of the lines that weren't intentional that you didn't see before really start to come out because there's nothing else distracting you. When you're really in the moment, and this happens to me all the time when I'm out with my camera, and one of the reasons I have to admit I don't like going out shooting with other people. I get lost looking for those details, looking for those stories. But because I'm always concerned about how other people are doing, it's hard for me to actually get into flow and just be in the moment where I can really discern all the details around me. And that's another reason why you want to be conscious of your emotions and your mindset. If my emotions are feeding into my social anxiety, which is something I've always struggled with, or my mindset is otherwise concerned with the comfort of others and whether they might be getting annoyed with me because I'm taking so long, (laughs) stopping at every texture and tree or whatever, it's going to be hard for me to engage in an artistic way of seeing because it's hard enough to get around all those expectations buried in the brain, those shortcuts the brain naturally takes on top of juggling concerns about the people around me. So if I'm going to be successfully circumventing all these hurdles that the brain is already putting in front of me, it takes a tremendous amount of focus and preferably it should be undisturbed focus. Now, that doesn't mean that you personally can't see creatively and have distractions around, but that's something you would need to discover for yourself, the extent to which you can have distractions and be able to focus. If you can set aside self-consciousness, the thoughts about what your market might want to see, all those kinds of things. If you can look without those concerns pushing their way in and getting between you and what you're observing, then you're going to find so much amazing inspiration in the world around you. Now, let's talk about fantastical sight. This is where your brain's expectations, emotional considerations, shortcuts, and the like have some possibility of being helpful. Now, not always, but it can be as detrimental in this particular type of scene, but that's part of something you also have to work out. Fantastical sight is about looking beyond the realism to the potential of the things around you. 
For example, I remember the first hike I took in Zion National Park, and it took me past this kind of cliff side, really short cliff side, where there was all these holes of all different sizes and shapes in the wall, just all over the place. But there were so many of them, and they seemed kind of purposeful. Now, if I had engaged my scientific mind at the time, I probably would have thought about the different types of rock or minerals that have been in the cliff and all the ways Mother Nature might have worn them down, or maybe certain animals would have dug these holes. I don't know how they were formed, but my mind went to fairy condos, like flying fairies, little fairies. I just thought if fairies had actually been real, that this totally would have been prime condo property for fairies. You know, penthouse towards the top of the cliff, the older fairies towards the bottom because they probably don't like to fly just like we don't like stairs as we get older, you know, that kind of thing. I just thought it'd be a wonderful community for this fantastic view of this beautiful park where the fairies are just doing their thing, living their lives. And I started making up all these stories about this fairy condo community. So instead of seeing what these holes actually were, and in reality, none of them were very deep, so it wouldn't have been much of a condo, but I let my mind go off in a direction that created something that doesn't exist from the things that I was seeing. I remember taking those images back and trying to figure out if I could replicate them in some kind of scene in some of the drawings I was doing at the time. I don't think I ended up using them, but I always remember how my mind just went off and got lost in this whole story I was writing based on this thing I was seeing that obviously wasn't a fairy condo, but I decided to see it that way. And that's the same thing as getting lost in the details of reality, trying to see things for what they really are, but it's kind of going in the opposite direction, right? Both types of seeing come from a curiosity and a fascination with the world that is shown to you. And that is probably the most encapsulating statement about artistic sight, artistic vision. It's about curiosity. It's about your personal fascination with the world you see, so much so that it wants to take you deeper and explore. Now, because I've said this before, art is about curiosity. It's about exploration. It's about discovery and seeing new things with an artistic view. I won't go into that further But I do want to point out that your artistic site is kind of the leader of your artistic expedition. And so you do want to hone that. You want to have a good leader, right? So there are kind of two ends of this spectrum that you kind of want to consider. I like to think of them as Mr. Magoo or Sherlock Holmes. Now, if you don't know who Mr. Magoo is, look it up. He's hilarious. He was this old cartoon character that was visually impaired. And he would find things along the way and then decide what it would be for him, basically mistaking things for something else, which is where the humor came in. But he's also not encumbered by all the things I just talked about that the brain does. It does obviously fill expectations for him that if he finds something before him that has a face and hands with five fingers, then he assumes it's a person when it turns out it's a chimpanzee or a mannequin or something. But basically... He's interacting with the reality and actually interpreting it differently. So it's just a fun metaphor for the fantastical part of the artistic site, at least for me. And then there's the Sherlock Holmes side, which is realistic sight, really seeing every detail for what it is and then seeing the implications of it. And that actually brings us to kind of the final point I want to talk about in terms of laying the groundwork for your artistic site. We can see things realistically or we can make up what things could potentially be, but this won't have much relevance to ourselves or our art if we don't understand what this means to us, how it can feed the intention of our art. And if you're confused about all this intention stuff, I would very much encourage you to go back to the first episode of this podcast, which is all about intention. But basically, intention is the why behind what you're doing what you're trying to say, the map that leads you through creating a piece or creating your career. Now, understanding the relevance of what you're seeing can help you identify what it is about an object or a place or a person that awakens your curiosity, that tickles your artistic spirit, your muse, right? Let's say you visit a beach in a faraway country. Chances are the color of the waters, maybe even the color of the sand are different than what you've seen before. There may be rock formations that are new to you. The people and what they're wearing and what they're doing may be different than what you've experienced before. Now, you can be in awe and feel immensely inspired by that beach. But when you get back to your studio, what is it that you will pick out of that experience that will help you recreate that feeling? Now, most people, in my experience, want to recreate the whole scene. 
It's the same with taking photographs when they're there. People love the wide angle lenses because they can get a whole scene in there. It makes them feel like they're capturing all of it. However, if you're familiar with really talented photographers, they often zero in on one aspect or crop out what might be considered major parts of a scene to most people. But that's because with an artistic eye, they've been able to break down what's in front of them to determine what the actual aspects are that mean the most to them that they want to share with their viewers. And that's something you would do as well, breaking down what's in front of you to determine what are the actual aspects of what you're seeing that mean the most to you that will, within the limitations of your medium and your art form, be able to express what you want to share about it. So let's say that foreign coast gives you a wonderful sense of harmony and peace, and that's really at the core of what you want to share. If so, maybe you don't include all the people you see, all the chairs, umbrellas, beach tiles, whatnot. Maybe you go and sit on one of the rock formations and watch the eddying water around the crags and pinnacles of rocks peeking up above the water. Maybe the way the water flows in is so mesmerizing that you realize that the steady ebb and flow represents a balance, a tranquility, a constancy that maybe you've been searching for in your personal life or your life work balance. So it speaks to you. If this is the kind of effect the space is having on you and you're not aware of it, you might go home, paint a coastal scene that reminds you of this place and feel like it's not anything close to what you're trying to say. But if you go back and you paint the eddies of water, if you create even an abstract pattern that reflects that ebb and flow that you saw, you may very well find that you've captured the most memorable part of your experience in a true and intense way. Other people may not realize that these patterns represent an experience on a coastal vacation, but then you realize that isn't what you're trying to share at that point, is it? You're trying to share the tranquility and the balance and that feeling that you got from watching it. That's what part of seeing really is, is realizing what it is that you're trying to share. You weren't trying to share the beach. You were trying to share the feeling that you had while you were there. So that last part probably will seem like it has more to do with identifying what it is that you want to say than actually seeing. But that is part of the process of seeing things for what they really are, because you are part of the scene every single time and how you feel. And what it means to you is a big part of the visuals that you're taking in. Remember, the brain interprets through your emotions and your experiences and things that are important to you. And so what you're going to see, what you're going to take in, what you're going to take back into your studio is going to be in part identifying what those things are for you, not just what your brain is interpreting and giving to you. The trick is digging through all that information that's before you and finding the information and the inspiration that will feed your particular muse. Let's now move on to the practice, the kind of how-to stuff. Let's talk specifically about ways to see as an artist. Now, these points I'm going to give you are not all-inclusive. They're not going to cover everything. They will be a great place to start or will remind you of things you've already known but may have let slip. First of all, to see artistically, you want to try to see with the eyes of a child like everything is brand new. You know, have you ever been away from the house for a long time, like a couple weeks or a month and you come home and everything looks kind of odd? It's because your brain hasn't interacted with that space for a while. So it's getting kind of reacquainted. And during that time, your experience can be pretty childlike. I know I tend to come home and get really fascinated with our acacia wood floors. They're kind of dramatic. And there's also this squiggly texture in the copper range hood over our kitchen island. I don't know why those things always always like stand out to me when I walk in the house. And yet I see them every day normally, but I don't take them in, right? They just become too familiar and my brain ignores them. Now, you can circumvent this to some extent by simply asking yourself what you see and get super detailed about it, like you're explaining it to someone who can't see. You can also go around with a camera and try to find small, interesting things instead of big scenes. Give yourself some parameters, like only photograph things that are less than two inches wide or only things that are on the ground, something like that, something that is not your usual view of things to kind of shake things up. You also want to look at things with intention. If you're familiar with Claude Monet's work, you probably know that he never painted anything just once. He painted his scenes over and over and over again, not because he was trying to perfect the image, but because if he went out at a different time of day or a different time of the year, 
He knew the scene would look different because the light changes throughout the day and throughout the year, as well as through different kinds of weather. He was rather obsessive about this, and he would actually carry around multiple canvases, all marked with the place and the time that he was painting on them so that he could return to the same place around the same time at the same time of year to continue working on them. So in reality, he wasn't painting his garden or even the lilies there or the cathedral or the bridges or the haystacks. He was painting the light. He was painting the colors the light created on the objects before him. So his intention was to capture the varying quality of light. And you can do the same kind of thing. Identify the thing or things that captivate you and try to consciously find them out in the world. Like I know my obsession is with textures, particularly textures of deterioration. So when I go out, especially when I do my macro photography or when I'm working with polymer or even when I'm painting, I like to fill my well with examples I see out in the world, like rusty metals, fallen leaves, decaying wood, that kind of thing. Because I photograph, I'm often taking pictures of these textures. But if you go out and you find these things, you can sketch them or write about them or just tell somebody about them. But if you can make them significant in some way beyond the moment that you found them, you'll remember them and it'll be easier for you to take them into the studio and use them. Now, your kind of inspiration might be more specific than what I'm talking about or simpler. It just is whatever it needs to be for you. You might love flowers or babies or fairies. Whatever it is, identify the visual fascination and go out and look for those things in the world or for the things that would build those kinds of images for you. You could also go out and imagine what you want to see, like we were talking about with the Fantastical site. You may have seen the reels that I put on Instagram, the ones I did to kind of go along with the Feed Your Muse episode, episode 14. One of them was from the crater at the Haleakala National Park in Maui. This place looks like it's on Mars. So when I was up there, I would just like imagine I was standing on Mars and then I just start to notice things like how quiet it was, how brisk the air was, how there was a complete lack of scent, which was kind of trippy. I know those things aren't visual, but they feed into the kind of recreation that I might want to bring back to the studio and experience and transfer into my art. And the truth is, I probably wouldn't have noticed what I liked so much about this space if I didn't let my imagination run wild. Seeing what it could be helps you see what it is. And aspects will come forward that you might have overlooked because it didn't mean much to you when you're just seeing the reality of it, but it's everything to the fantasy of it. And if you work in fantasy, then you can find those things out in the real world that can be the seeds for your imagination to create new worlds or new types of people or to be speculative about our future or whatever it is that you want to create to share with people. You can also force your brain to see things it would not otherwise acknowledge. You may have noticed if you buy a car, Suddenly you see that car everywhere where before you thought it was kind of a rare thing. Now I bought a Honda minivan during the pandemic. <laughs> you know, the kids are gone. I buy a, a soccer mom van so I could turn it into a camper van. It's kind of funny. I've seen them around, of course, but I hadn't realized quite how many. But after I bought one, suddenly they're everywhere and I can't find my van in a parking lot because there's so many gray Honda minivans. So now I put all these stickers all over it so I can actually find my van. But the thing is, is I had no idea there's so many vans around because I was not paying attention. So you can use this to your advantage. You can pick something you want to be more attentive about and give yourself specifics to find, like kind of an artsy where's Waldo, right? So it'll give you this heightened awareness that will actually force your brain to feed you that information when those kinds of things are around. Like I do ICM photography now and I see so much more contrast and line in the worlds around me because that's what I need to find for the type of ICM that I do. I didn't see nearly so much before I did this kind of thing, but I sure do now. So let's say color contrast is something that you're struggling with. Go out and learn about color and then go out into the world and look for color contrast, look for interesting color pairings, take walks and specifically make notes or take pictures of color contrast that you enjoy. I guarantee you, even when you're not looking for them for the next few days or weeks afterwards, you're going to see color contrasts in cereal boxes in your cupboard, in the clothes hanging in your closet, and of course, in the artwork you see online. You'll just simply become more aware of it. You can also mess with your site to help you develop a more artistic site. 
you can squint at things and use kind of your fantastical artistic sight to imagine what else these things are that you're looking at because now they're kind of transformed by squinting. It just forces you to see the objects or scenes very differently, right? You can also look at things upside down and backwards, just a different view. This is actually something you can do with your own artwork. Take it to a mirror and look at it through a mirror and assess the design elements because your brain won't see what it's been seeing the whole time you've been working on it anymore. And this is especially good for assessing things like composition and balance issues, but it helps with other design concerns as well. And you can do this with a wider world. Just find a way to change your view, like hang upside down if you can, or lay on the ground and look up at things or climb up and look down at things. Just that change of view will make you look at things quite differently. And you can find some fantastic forms and lines and things doing that as well. In a related approach, take things out of their usual context and put them somewhere new or somewhere kind of unusual. Say there's this bright red apple sitting on your white countertop and it just looks really amazing and really cool. Take it and put it in like a brown basket. Suddenly it's not going to look as red. Then you may realize it's not the redness or the roundness or the glossy look of the apple that was capturing your eye, but the contrast between the red and the white. And so now you'll know what's intrigued you and what you want to work with. Okay, that was a lot of information, right? I think the one big takeaway from all this information is that seeing takes vigilance. Even though I've talked about this throughout my career, I still have to remind myself to stop and actually look and see and think through what I'm seeing and not just take my brain's interpretation at face value. Practice does help, but it can also be tiring to be so attentive all the time. So in reality, most of us, even the most attentive artists, probably spend more time letting their brain do its limiting shortcut thing than stopping and seeing. And that's okay. The poor brain needs a rest too, right? But try to go out with purpose, with intention on a regular basis, daily if possible, and just look at the world through some version of artistic sight. Take a walk or a drive or just wander through your backyard or the attic or the basement or whatever kind of place might hold the things that tend to feed your muse. I kind of gave you a lot of information, I know. So if you're a little overwhelmed or don't feel like you caught everything, do bookmark this episode and come back to it later. There's also a transcript that you can find for all the episodes. They're on the sagearts.com website. But mind you, it's transcribed by an AI because real people transcription is a little too rich for me. So they can be a little bit wonky, but you could go through and highlight things to remind you of the things that you heard that you wanted to make note of and revisit. So yeah, go to sagearts.com, click on the episodes part of the navigation bar, and then go to the episode that you want and you'll find the transcription there. That website is also how you contact me. So you can send me your thoughts, your ideas, your criticisms, whatever it is that you want. Go to the contact page on the stagearts.com website and use the email form or the leave me a message voicemail button. You can also visit with me on social media on Instagram or Facebook. Both of the accounts are under the Sage Arts podcast there. And if I've opened your eyes, so to speak, you can give back in some small way. I have donation buttons on the website at thesagearts.com. Just scroll down the homepage a little ways to find the buy me a coffee and PayPal donation buttons. You can also buy yourself some Feed the Muse stickers or even buy yourself a beautiful polymer art book like the Retrospective Polymer Journeys book. You don't even have to be into polymer. It's just amazing sculpture, art jewelry, illustrative and wall art. You can buy the stickers in the books at 10thmusearts.com. That's T-E-N-T-H, so 10thmusearts.com. Okay, enough of all that. Do go out now and see what you can see with these newly opened eyes of yours. Keep up with finding your daily stories as well. Immerse yourself in new and novel experiences. Just keep feeding your muse and be true to the weirdness that is so wonderfully you. I'll catch up with you next time on the Sage Arts Podcast.